Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Casey. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. Uh, it's my job to welcome all of you on behalf of the university, and particularly John Carr, and the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown here. Uh, we have, a, I think, a remarkable evening in lined up. Uh, my job is simply to say hello, say a few words, and sit down and let the rodeo begin, which John is going to start uh, in just a moment. We have a number of, of co-sponsors in addition to the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life here. We'd like to thank the Institute for Politics and also Public Service at Georgetown and the Democracy Fund. The purpose of our event tonight, Faith in the Faithful in the Democratic Party, is to look at the role of faith and roles of the faithful in U.S. politics, which are often misunderstood today and neglected. This topic generates confusion and conflict, uh, and as religious communities change, political leaders and parties evolve, it gets even more complicated and harder to understand. This is the third in a three-part series to explore the intersection of faith, politics, and public life, and it will focus specifically on the Democratic Party. Now, as somebody who's worked for both God and Caesar over the course of my checkered career, I've been asked to offer just a few brief reflections, having sat really on both sides of that great divide. Let me begin by speaking theologically. I'm trained as a theological ethicist, and two broad points here. Number one, no political party, and I'm speaking as a Christian theologian, no political party embodies the whole Christian gospel despite what you might have heard from one of the political parties. <laughs> Secondly, having said that, I believe Christians are called, as Gaudium et Spes, the last document of the Second Vatican Council, argues, we are called to read the signs of the times in light of the gospel. So even though no political agenda embodies the whole of Christian belief, nevertheless, we are to pursue things like love and justice and the common good, but we have to discriminate and we have to use the gift of the virtue of prudence to make up our minds, to read the times as they are. Now, a few years ago, I actually wrote a book on the role of religion in the 1960 presidential campaign, and I came up with four political maxims. I'm going to read those to you, then I'm going to sit down and shut up. Uh, I had four pieces of advice for contemporary religious groups and for contemporary politicians at the intersection of religion and politics. The first one is, if you're a candidate and you don't understand the nature of your opposition, particularly among religious communities, it's your duty to go and learn and listen to what people of deep faith who disagree with you have to think, and not to be afraid to have those conversations, because if you don't show up, there can be no conversation, there can be no democracy. So you have to be courageous, and maybe this is harder for Democrats to do today than for Republicans. I'll, I'll let the panelists debate that. Number two, a lot of times, Politicians are tempted to clandestinely organize religious groups and raise money, and I think that's bad democratic form. Interact with religious communities transparently. Now, in terms of ecclesi ecclesiastical advice, the third piece of advice is it's a good thing that faith communities are politically independent. That's good for faith communities, but that's also good for our democratic polity. One of the tasks of faith communities is to remind the state and politicians of its proper functions, to provide for the common good of the nation, to uphold justice not only for its citizens but for everyone in the world, to provide for the welfare of the dispossessed, to strive for peace in the world. And that requires faith communities to maintain some cre critical distance from the state and the politicians. So any kind of interaction has to be on the basis of an ad hoc relationship that's always subject to renegotiation. Permanent covenants and permanent alliances between political parties and faith groups always leads to mischief, both for democracy and for the health of faith communities. And so finally, politicians who are the ones who are tempted to try to build these religious groups into dependent permanent alliances, it rests primarily on the faith communities themselves to maintain independence in their alliances. So that's my two cents worth. The, the, the panelists get to debate that and a thousand other propositions today, and I'm so excited that they're here. Let me say a couple of closing remarks about the purpose of the initiative. It's in its fifth year, the initiative on Catholic social thought and public life, and it's organized more than 40 gatherings, and it's been attended by more than 16,000 people. And it's become a respected place of dialogue in the applications 
of Catholic social thought to key national and global issues. And it hopes to encourage a new generation of Catholic lay leaders to become salt, light, and leaven, to use the biblical language, in public life. I admire what John has done. It's really remarkable to think in five years what you've accomplished here, going from zero to where you are today. Uh, the initiative strives to be a vital sign of Georgetown's Catholic and Jesuit identity in action. John himself is probably no stranger to folks here. Prior to founding and directing the initiative, he served for over 20 years as director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He held a residential fellowship at the Institute of Politics of Harvard University during the 2012-2013 academic year. A very tough job, but someone had to do it, and uh, I'm sure you, you had a good time. Uh, and he was previously served as executive director of the White House Conference on Families and as director of the National Committee for Full Employment. So please join me in welcoming John Carr. Uh, I apologize for the delay in getting started. Uh, you've all come out on a warm evening. And uh, after we solve the religion problem of the Democratic Party, we're going to solve traffic in Washington because uh, one of our panelists is stuck. And then we just got word that Maria Teresa Kumar uh, had an emergency and she is boarding an airplane uh, in an hour uh, to respond to that. So uh, the rest of us will try and fill in. Uh, we look forward to Michael Weir joining us uh, shortly. Uh, I sort of imagine one of my right wing friends emailing me and saying it would be a cold day in hell before Georgetown had a panel on faith in the Democratic Party. Well, uh, it's actually a hot evening in Washington. <laughs> but we are going to have a really important discussion about faith and the Democratic Party uh, with some remarkable voices. And the only thing hotter than uh, the temperature is uh, the debate uh, that is an example of where faith in the faithful ought to make a difference. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar, uh, sadly, from my perspective, with this situation where uh, families are being separated as they enter this country and young children are being taken away from their parents. And it is no accident uh, that before the politicians step forward, religious leaders from across the spectrum, Catholic bishops, yes, but in the evangelical community, the African-American, of course, the Latino community stood up and said, not only is this unwise, this is wrong. And then we had the, the frankly, bizarre scene of the Attorney General and the White House Press Secretary uh, practicing theology without a license, <laughs> uh, trying to justify this and uh, ignoring uh, the fundamental message of uh, the Word of God about welcoming the stranger, uh, caring for the children, and uh, measuring our lives by how we treat the least of these. So that is a good example of where faith and public life has come together. And to their great credit, uh, leaders of the Democratic Party have stepped up, and now some Republicans have stepped up. I find it just amazing that former First Lady Laura Bush has chosen, I think, her first stop at uh, to jump up here. But all is not well in terms of the Democratic Party and religion. Uh, there, there was a time, I show my bias, I'm Irish and Catholic. Uh, I always say I'm a product of a mixed marriage. My mother from a uh, Republican family, my dad from a Democratic family. But that sort of came with the heritage in our Irish family. And we were aligned very much uh, with the Democratic Party. Uh, and it reminds me of a story you may have heard me tell or E.J. Dion uh, tell of a woman, Mrs. O'Reilly, in <laughs> Chicago. She loved her faith, her family, and the Democratic Party, not necessarily in that order. And on election day, her son, who had moved to the suburbs and had become a Republican, much to her dismay, came back to take her to the polls. And they argued, as they always do. And he said, Mother, if Jesus Christ himself came back as a Republican, you wouldn't vote for him. And she looked at him and said, well, why would he change his party affiliation <laughs> after all these years? 
Well, that may be true for Mrs. O'Reilly, but it's not true for a lot of uh, religious voters who have uh, uh, become somewhat disenchanted with the Democratic. Some have left, some are uneasy. Some have found their voice in the Democratic Party. And if Maria Theresa would hear, she would say quite clearly is the Democratic Party is the place for religious people to speak about issues of poverty and health care and human rights and women's rights and LBGTQ rights and all the rest. But that's not a unanimous view. And so uh, what is going on? We're going to talk about that. One of the things that's going on, I think Elizabeth will help us understand this, there is a question of whether our faith shapes our politics or whether it's the other way around. And in fact, uh, what we're probably going to hear that in a lot of ways, it's not what we believe that shapes what we do. It's in some ways who we are, what our economic status, our ethnic group, our prejudices, our party, our ideology that shapes uh, our political behavior more than our principles. Uh, the Democratic Party, which used to be, and this will be controversial, used to be the vehicle, I think, for expression of this, uh, is, looks to be, at least me, to me, heading in a somewhat different direction. Uh, a coalition less of working class, uh, immigrant, Irish, uh, Polish, white working class, but also uh, Latinos, African Americans, and teachers, and union members. But now seems to be moving towards a coalition that is more of educated and cultural elites, uh, singles and seculars. I once heard one of the uh, consultants talk about, and uh, and the continuing support of the African American and Latino communities. And it's a party that is focused more on identity, but seems not to be focusing on the identity and the inclusion of voters who take their identity from their religious faith as a reason to get involved in politics. Now, I know everybody uh, can argue about that. Mark Shields uh, was with us the other night at another event, and uh, he said you can tell the health of an organization, a church, or a political party by whether they're looking for heretics or converts. And one question tonight is, yeah, is the leadership of the Democratic Party looking for converts? Are they looking to engage and persuade? Are they listening and learning, as Sean said? Or are they uh, proposing an agenda that people have to fit into? <clears throat> and there's been a cost for that. Uh, Several people on this panel worked for President Obama's election. Uh, the, uh, since he was elected, the Democratic Party has lost 900 state legislative seats. It has lost 12 governors, uh, 69 House members, and 13 senators. Uh, 32 states have Republican legislators, legislatures, 14 have Democratic legislatures. So, while in some ways the Democratic Party feels confident that history and demography is moving its way, it's not here yet. Uh, this is a party that lost to Donald Trump, uh, which is in a statement of health. So with that happy news, uh, I want to turn to our panel, introduce them briefly, and then um, uh, ask them the question. Uh, the Atlantic had a headline, does the, Dem the Democratic Party's religion problem? My question is, does the Democratic Party have a religion problem? If it does, what is it? Where does it come from? And later on, we'll talk about what they can do with it. So let me begin by introducing Elizabeth. And Elizabeth taught me how to pronounce her name, and I'm going to uh, butcher it. Elizabeth Padraic Sepak. Close? Very close. All right. Elizabeth comes to us from the Pew Research Center, the place to go for data on this. She grew up in Philadelphia. I ask you not to hold that against her. Uh, she still roots for the Phillies. That's two strikes. Uh, she got a master's in international affairs. Uh, she, uh, there are two things I learned about Elizabeth that are really interesting. She 
uh, used a Pew Center report in doing a paper in college. And when she graduated, she applied and got a job. So work on those college papers. <laughs> and secondly, she met her husband at a softball game on the mall. So uh, take advantage of the <laughs> softball on the mall. Uh, she has done a lot of work on uh, the religious landscape, on Latino voters, on Jewish and Muslim voters. Elizabeth, could you give us a little bit of an overview on sort of what is the situation of faith and the faithful in the Democratic Party? Sure. Um, as, as with any group, with any you know, large group, the, the Democratic Party, it is this coalition of, of many smaller groups. It's not necessarily um, one block of voters, as we've seen. You do have a large share of religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the atheist, agnostic, nothing in particular. Um, you do have a large share who identify as that, about a third of Democratic Party are nuns. Um, but you also have some of these smaller groups. You have a, a small share of white evangelical Protestants, of white mainline Protestants, and you have a pretty steady share of black Protestants. Uh, that is, this group has been relatively steady over the past couple decades. Um, so while the composition, the religious composition of the Democratic Party has been changing slightly due to other demographic changes, uh, this part of the coalition has remained relatively stable. Um, and as we've seen, there are also other smaller groups, other uh, about one or two percent of the Democratic Party are Jewish, are Muslim, and a variety of other smaller faiths. So it is this wide range here uh, in the party, and that is possibly some of what could be contributing to maybe not a disconnect, but a lack of consensus on some of these religious issues because there are so many different religions represented here. And so that's, that's one of the areas that we can see here, just this wide variety of religious groups. Okay, can you talk about, Pew has this typography that I find just amazing of sort of American politics. You have these clever names and the different coalitions within uh, each party. Pew has a category called the devout and diverse within the Democratic Party. Can you talk about who those people are and what contribution they make to the party? Sure, so the devout and diverse, and we did try to be clever with some of these names. We wanted them to stick, right? And so this one clearly stuck, so I will say congrats to our politics team for that. Um, so the devout and diverse, they make up about 9% or so of the population overall and of registered voters overall. So they are a relatively small group. But like it says, they are diverse in both their uh, race and ethnicity, so they are what we call a majority minority party. It's about three in 10 are African American, about 16% or so are Hispanic, and maybe 7% along those lines are of another, another race or mixed race. And so there is this large racial diversity within the devout and diverse. Um, the majority are dem democratic or lean toward the Democratic Party, but that's not the entire party. There's still about a quarter who lean toward the GOP. So it's not just a monolith there. Um, and they have these, it's not just diverse in race and ethnicity, but it's diverse in some of their views too. So they do hold a lot of traditionally democratic views. They uh, are very similar to, democratic, to Democrats overall on feelings toward the social safety net um, and furthering racial equality in the United States. Uh, but they are a little bit more conservative on measures of global engagement, uh, views of business regulations, attitudes on homosexuality, and some attitudes toward immigrants as well. Um, as far as the devout part, uh, they, a majority, about more than, more than six in 10, say that it is necessary to believe in God in order to be moral, um, but, and about half or so are Protestant, including about a quarter who are black Protestants. Um, and then there are about an even share of Catholics, about one in five are Catholic, and another one in five are religiously unaffiliated. So it is this very kind of wide ranging, covering all the bases group that are included in this devout and diverse category here. Yeah. It's interesting to me when some of us look at the Democratic Party and say it's increasingly a secular party, mm -hmm. when in fact that is the building block of who they are and how they're gonna succeed if they are to succeed. I have the feeling, Justin, that might be your category 
uh, in that uh, you bring some diversity to this panel, and I think you're devout. Uh, that, that's a joke. Uh, more devout than I am. Justin uh, is an Atlanta lawyer. He's a political strategist. He is the founder and president of the Ann Campaign. I've known Justin for a few months, and I deeply resent him because the organization I wanted to found would be called the Ann Campaign, which brings the pieces of Catholic social teaching together, and he beat me to it. He's already got the <coughs> website, and he's actually got a lot of followers. And you can tell us the story of uh, how you came to found that group and why. He uh, went to uh, school at Vanderbilt. He played football, went to Vanderbilt Law School, born and raised in Denver, uh, now is in Atlanta, and has uh, helped leaders there get elected. And then he got elected himself as an Obama delegate to uh, the Democratic Convention and had some experience. The Ann campaign, you can explain it better than I do, tries to bring, as the name suggests, both social justice and moral convictions to politics, and particularly the Democratic Party. Uh, one person who wrote about uh, Justin said, he and the end campaign bring courage, kindness, and unshakable faith uh, to politics. So tell us a little bit about uh, your background and why you founded the end campaign and why you think it's necessary in today's Democratic Party. Sure, thanks John. Um, so as, as John said, I've been in politics uh, running campaigns and things of that nature for almost a decade. Uh, and doing that in urban pro uh, politics, you're in a very progressive space. And so there were certain issues that I had trouble really reconciling uh, with my faith. Um, being asked to run, uh, you know, uh, handling people's campaigns and their platforms, and just knowing that certain things were off limits. Um, and I didn't really think that was fair or understand it because the people that I go to church with, um, a lot of the people that I'm around are not necessarily secular progressive, so it was hard to understand why everyone had to fit into that box, but it seemed like we were being forced into that box. And so the end campaign basically came about when I got with some other people uh, that I knew and said, this needs to change. Why is it that we see social justice and biblical values as mutually exclusive? Um, when I look at the walk of Jesus, when I look through the gospel, I see biblical values and social justice, and that social justice is a biblical value along with other moral uh, imperatives. And so the and campaign literally means compassion and conviction, bringing love and the love and truth of the gospel together and letting people know that, that they can work together rather than being two things that we tend to separate uh, as if the left is for love and the right is for truth. The truth of the matter is if you don't have both uh, together, then you're, you're missing uh, something on both sides. So that's that's basically where the Ann campaign came from. Yeah. What happened when you ran? I mean, uh, you're obviously a skillful political operative. You were successful. Did people welcome this? Did it upset people? How, how was it received, both in your own community and among the leaders of the Democratic Party? Yeah. So the first time I ran which is, was in 2012, and I was really just tagging along. Some of the older... Uh, um, elected officials in Atlanta wanted someone younger to run on a slate with them, and they, I was honored, and they asked me, so I was kind of in the background. When I ran in 2016, it was a little bit of a different story. So I had a group called, uh, at the time, it was called Crucifix and Politics. And uh, I said, <laughs> you know what? We're in, we're in John Lewis's district. I said, you know what? I'm going to run on a biblical platform. So when I gave my speech, I didn't really even say anything about the party. I just talked about how the party can't be one that excludes people of faith. I talked about issues such as sanctity of life and all those things and how they don't change for biblical Christians, but we still deserve to be here. Um, and it was an interesting conversation. Uh, actually, there were a couple of groups after I got done. We won. The, the biggest thing, we won by huge numbers. We almost doubled or tripled anybody else's vote, votes in the mo one of the most progressive places in Atlanta. Uh, but after it was done, there were people who tried to get me removed from the Georgia delegation. Um, because of what I said about biblical values. Now, thankfully, I anticipated that, and I, I taped the whole thing. Uh, so they, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, kind of uh, move my words around. But it was a difficult conversation, and unfortunately, there was an attack just based on bringing a biblical perspective. We ended up winning, which I think said a lot, but there was also an attack there. So you see the dynamic in that small example. Yeah. I'm really struck. Uh, crucifix in politics, the devout and diverse 
You should have been around when we named the initiative. <laughs> <laughs> that is about the most boring name we could come up with. <laughs> Obviously, it was a committee. Uh, uh, well, that's quite a story. Uh, I, somehow, I don't, can't get used to the idea of you tagging along. Uh, <laughs> it seems to me you might be a leader. Uh, Michael, welcome. Uh, we said in your absence that after we solved the problem in the Democratic Party, we solved the problem of traffic yes. in Washington. Uh, so uh, we're glad you're with us. I'm going to turn next to uh, Cecil, President Roberts. Cecil is a uh, fourth generation, uh, sixth generation mine worker. I read oh, where two, uh, two of your grandparents, grandfathers uh, died in the mines. He has been elected four times, five times, as president of the United Mine Workers. Some of you are old enough to remember when that was a dangerous thing, uh, not only to work in the mines, but to run as an advocate of democracy in the mine workers campaign. His leadership has been recognized by the AFL-CIO. He's a vice president. He's a member of the executive committee. When I talked to our friends over at the AFL-CIO and I said, we want to do, have a real discussion about faith in the faithful in the Democratic Party, uh, they said, you have to get Cecil. <laughs> he is your guy. Uh, they, in fact, thought you were a minister. It turns out you're just a preacher. <laughs> uh, but uh, they said you could preach. Uh, one of the stories I heard about uh, Cecil was 20 years ago, he and Jesse Jackson went through communities in Appalachia to talk about injustice, racial injustice, injustice against workers and what they had in common. I was very struck that the president of the mine workers from West Virginia won the Martin Luther King Award from the Rainbow Coalition. Uh, he has two children, three grandsons, two granddaughters. And one great grandson. Oh, wow. wow. I'm old. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, diverse and devout. <laughs> uh, uh, but how is it that the, the party that has been for so many decades the voice of working people, often working people who have their union and their church as the bulwark of their lives, seemingly has less clout, less influence in the party these days? How do, you, how do your members, how do you see the place of faith in the faithful in the Democratic Party? Well, let me make a, a couple of observations, if I might. First of all, I'm a couple of things here. I'm the second coal miner I've been on this campus, I think. Rick Rich was here, so I guess that makes me second. Uh, so the other thing is I'm probably, might be the only person on this panel that's been arrested repeatedly for nonviolent civil disobedience, which I'm very proud of, by the way, uh, and traveling with Reverend Jackson back in the 90s, and I'm very proud of that relationship because I consider labor leaders and civil rights leaders being the same thing because that's an obligation I think everybody in this room should embrace because all of us should believe that all God's children should have equal opportunity in this society, and that's something I firmly believe in. The third thing is that I appear to be the only person on this uh, panel that doesn't have an accent, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me explain that. God talks like me, so <clears throat> if you don't believe that, someday when you get to the pearly gates and St. Peter says, y'all getting a pickup truck, we're going up to the pearly gates here shortly. You understand what I'm saying, right? I'm going to uh, say I know oh. Cecil. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm still in good stead by, at that point. But let, let, let's, let me just point something out, if I might. From uh, all my life, uh, growing up in the coal camps of, of West Virginia when I was a child and teenager in high school, I never, I, I, when I was younger, I never met a Republican because everybody was a Democrat. And every one of those coal company houses, you could go into them, and there'd be three pictures on the wall. One would be John L. Lewis, the greatest labor leader that, that ever lived. Franklin Roosevelt, which the miners always uh, believed that he gave them a right to a middle class uh, uh, lifestyle. And, and Jesus, that is not the case now. And why is that? I think that uh, uh, the perspective of, of people, particularly in Appalachia, uh, those of you who know anything about Appalachia where I've come from, it's been a hard, uh, difficult time for most of, of our 
uh, existence. Um, we've had people come in like uh, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Bobby Kennedy, what we talked about previously to try to lift us up and uh, into a middle class lifestyle. The one thing that allowed that to happen was the United Mine Workers of America. And I'd point out that uh, we were the largest, most powerful union in 1935, and we didn't just enjoy that for ourselves. We went out to the uh, steel towns in Pittsburgh and across this country, uh, the auto towns across this country. We feel that we built the middle class because we offered up the opportunity for everybody to enjoy the middle class lifestyle and, and to join a union and be able to stand up for themselves. One of the problems we have in our society today, maybe the biggest one, is that the powerful are too powerful and the rich are too rich. Uh, and that's, that's, that is the issue. If too few folks got too much money is a simple way to say that when, where, where I'm from. But what I feel, and I think many feel, particularly in Appalachia, is that sometimes people, even in the Democratic Party, who are good, decent, people make comments and take positions that are extremely painful to those of us who come from that area. So I think some people think we're stupid. If you've got an accent like me, I know we talk about uh, uh, not discriminating for against people because of the race, creed, color, and national origin. You can also sometimes discriminate against people because of where they're from. It's just as soon as you find out somebody's from eastern Kentucky or south uh, western Virginia or southern West Virginia, first thing that comes in some people's mind, and they're probably not too swift, uh, and you know they probably don't understand these complicated issues of our time, and so that's a form of discrimination. And we've had two presidential candidates, and I worked uh, hard in 2008 for President Obama, but he did make a comment in California, that extremely painful and talked about us embracing our Bible. What, I don't understand it. a man as intelligent as him. What, what's wrong with people? I imagine many people in this room embrace their Bible every single night, and I don't see that as a problem. I don't see that as something wrong. I think it's something to be complimented, not criticized. And then talked about what well, they like their guns. So yes, we love to hunt in Appalachia, and people have been doing that forever. So sometimes when people make comments, it's like they're looking down their nose at us. Mm. At the same time, they ask us to vote for them <laughs> and to stand up for them and work ourselves to death for them. And that's painful and it's hurtful. And then the last uh, candidate we had said something extremely uh, uh, unartful, to say the least. That was her <laughs> explanation for it. So we're going to put a lot more coal miners out of work. Maybe that's what's going to happen. But the one thing I would say that people have taken positions that put coal miners out of work. That's one thing. But where's the position that you're taking to put people back to work? Where's the position you're taking to defend their health care? Where's the position you're taking to pen, defend their pensions? It doesn't exist. So sometimes when over and over and over again, we hear the same thing. Stand up for us. We're the party of workers. Well, how about proving that you're the party of workers as opposed to telling us that you're the party of workers. There's a great difference between saying something and doing something. You will be judged by how you treat the least of these. You'll be judged here on earth by what you do, not what you say. Hmm. Sorry, to get uh, on the, sorry to get on a high horse. Uh, you are a preacher. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in our family, it was a little different. We had a picture of John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Pope John the 23rd, and uh, now we'd have a picture of Pope Francis, but uh, sometimes would people think we might not have the right pictures on the wall. <laughs> Michael, uh, Michael is a remarkable person. He runs a new outfit. Uh, let me get the name of this right, because uh, again, you at a committee put this together as well. <laughs> uh, Public Square Strategies, but you probably know him for his book, which uh, started off or it didn't start off, but really brought into focus this debate about the religion problem the Democrats may have. It's uh, Reclaiming Hope, Lessons Learned in the Obama White House about the Future of Faith in America. Uh, nice, catchy, short, clever title there. Uh, the the uh, Michael... Not as catchy as the initial yeah, about yeah. Catholic social thought and public life. Well, we may have had the same consultants. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> which means none. Uh, the, uh, he was the religious outreach uh, director 
for the Obama re-election campaign, and it's worth pointing out that's the last time the Democrats won the presidency. It is. It is. Uh, he worked in the Obama faith-based office. Joshua Dubois was part of one of our sessions uh, on this earlier. Uh, he was one of the youngest staffers in the history of the White House. Uh, he, uh, this is really interesting to me. He's a proud evangelical, and uh, I don't know what pictures were on your wall when you grew up, <laughs> but I don't think there were any popes. That's just my <laughs> guess. But uh, the Catholic group of millennials named Michael the Millennial of the Year for the courage he had shown in standing up uh, for social justice and values and human life and human dignity. So he's a proud person from Buffalo. That takes some endurance as well. <laughs> Probably good preparation for the role he plays in the party. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us what that experience was like and why you think the Democrats have a religion problem. Yeah, well, working for, the, for President Obama was an immense honor. And what was important was uh, his interest in and engagement with religion uh, was embedded early in his professional career. Everyone knows that he was a community organizer. Not uh, enough people know that uh, his first job as a community organizer was funded by the Catholic Church. And he was following a specific model of community organizing that was focused on churches. You know, so there are, all, you know, there are efforts to focus community organizing on door-to-door -door knocking, barber shops, all kinds of, but his model was focused exclusively on churches. Um, I've been reading David Garrow's biography of the President Rising Star, and I think for those who think they know the president but don't think faith had much to do with his background, if you read the first, it's a long book, if you read the first 400, 500 pages of that book, you'll get a, you'll get a pretty good sense. Uh, and so, you know, this was a part of who he was. We all remember when he really launched on the national stage in 2004, uh, he talked about the awesome God we serve in the blue states. Uh, he talked about the fact that uh, I am my brother's keeper. This was explicitly, he, he wasn't being, he, it's important to understand, he knew exactly what he was doing. He wanted to send a message that after eight years of one model of religious outreach uh, that was promoted by the Republicans, that he wasn't going to let that vote, uh, he wasn't going to cede that vote to Republicans. He wasn't going to cede that vote to John McCain. Uh, in 2006, he, of course, gave a speech at uh, the Called Renewal Conference, where he actually took the time to lay out a comprehensive vision of faith and public life uh, for uh, the American people. Just like Democrats would go to a women's conference or uh, National Council of La Raza or NAACP, he said, look, we, we're a profoundly religious country and religious people like any other constituency deserve to hear what the president thinks of them or what a candidate for a president thinks of them. Uh, Cecil's absolutely right. Uh, David Pluff writes about the cling to religion comment that the president made at a San Francisco fundraiser. What's important about that is, um, well, one of the things that's important about that, I agree, was a, let, let's just say it didn't make my job any easier. Uh, um, uh, what was important about that is he had built up enough of a reservoir of trust that he was able to get over that. So uh, David Pluff in his book recounts a conversation he overheard at a bar, I think, in Pittsburgh of uh, a voter saying, well, maybe this is really who Barack Obama is. And the person sitting with him said, well, I, I don't know. That doesn't sound like the guy I've heard on the campaign trail and the guy whose books I've read and whose speeches I've heard. Uh, maybe we ought to give him another chance. And that is essentially what voters did in 2008, what voters did in 2012. Uh, but you have to work to build up that reservoir of trust. You have to do the interviews with Christianity Today and America Magazine and go out to these communities and uh, speak to the National Hispanic Prayer Breakfast and make sure that just like any other, like this isn't too complicated. Democratic faith outreach is about policy, rhetoric, and institutional systems for engaging that community just like any other community. Uh, I think, John, what we've seen is uh, the, the Democrats, and this didn't just start in 2016, the Democrats are always looking for the time when they could declare God is dead, and then they remember he's alive after they lose a couple times uh, at the ballot box. 
Uh, I mean, we don't need to just think of Time and Newsweek covers that have sort of sent this idea. We had, uh, we had pollsters writing that it was the end of uh, white Christian America and declaring values voters were done. We had a Clinton senior advisor, according to E.J. Dion, say that uh, the Clinton campaign was going to be the first to run a post-Christian campaign. Well, that's a great strategy, except for the fact that 70% of Americans consider themselves to be Christian. So, I mean, maybe that's aspirational from their perspective, but what kind of data-minded campaign looks at a country that identifies as 70% Christian and says, we're going to run the first post-Christian campaign, a losing one? That's the kind. Um, and so it, Democrats have the opportunity, uh, as they always have, and especially in this time, and hopefully we'll get into this with the current president that we have, to, to get back in on the conversation about values, John, to get back in in the conversation about faith. And what it, but what it requires is not one-offs. It doesn't just require pointing out how bad Donald Trump is. It doesn't just, uh, it, they actually have to show that they care about the faith community, the diverse faith community and all of its diversity, not just Christians, but including Christians and Christians uh, speaking to them directly, speaking to Catholics directly, speaking to evangelicals directly. Uh, and and that, that'll be a big part of, of doing this. Uh, the last thing I'll say is everyone talks about the 81% number, 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump, especially if you're a Democrat. If you're going to talk about the 81% number, you also have to talk about the 16% number, which is that Hillary Clinton only won 16% of white evangelicals. Uh -huh. Only 16%. That's less than John Kerry. That's less than Barack Obama in 2000. That's five points less than Barack Obama in 2012 after uh, he had been accused of engaging on a war on religion and after he had been the first sitting president to endorse gay marriage. And he still got five points more of the white evangelical vote than Hillary Clinton. The, the, you really have to be engaging in serious political malpractice to get 16% of white evangelicals. And the reason for that is that she sent the very clear message to those voters that she didn't even want their vote, that she didn't care about their vote. At the very same time, Donald Trump was saying, I'm the only one who cares about you. <laughs> if, if, if you elect me, I'll protect you. If you don't, you'll be left to the dogs. And Hillary Clinton basically said yes. And that's a major problem for the Democratic Party if we're going to be a national party that's thriving in state houses, uh, that's taking back Congress, and that takes back the White House in 2020. If I explained, uh, Michael, before you arrived that Maria Teresa got in touch with us and had a, uh, an emergency, so she's on an airplane uh, right about now. If she were here, uh, she would echo some of these themes, but she would pick up some others. One, that uh, white Catholics uh, may be having some problems uh, with the Democratic Party, but Latino Catholics have kept the Catholic community as the bellwether in American politics that split almost 50-50 as a community. And one of my fears is that people like me who talk about the Catholic vote, first of all, in E.J. Dion's line, there is no Catholic vote and it's really important <laughs> uh, <laughs> that we're talking about the white Catholic vote. And Elizabeth, you've done some work about Latinos and politics and their faith. Can you share a little bit of those dynamics? Uh, sure. Some of some of the some of the older uh, the kind of the Latino vote that's a little bit older data and not quite as relevant to some of this most recent 2016 stuff. But what we're looking at with the Latino share of the electorate, or at least the Latino Catholic share of the electorate of the Democratic Party, that is increasing. Latino Catholics are becoming somewhat more democratic over the past decade, right. while white Catholics are becoming more Republican. They are right. trending toward the GOP and where the Democratic Party is shifting, this religious coalition is shifting, they're losing white Catholics. And some of that, yes, is the fact that Catholics as a part of the American religious landscape overall are ticking down, they are shrinking a little bit, um, and that, that decline is somewhat offset by the influx of Latinos and Latino Catholics in particular. Mm. Um, but that is where some of the shift is coming from. The, the rest of it, I do wanna point out um, kind of to some of the points before that we are talking about the Democratic Party's religion problem and that's clear and has been a long time coming and all of that, but I want to make sure that we are not discounting the fact that the majority of the Democratic registered voters, yes. they are religious. Yep. 
So majority of them are not, you know, not irreligious here. You have just about a third who are religious nuns, and that, that is a growing share, but it's also a growing share of the American population as a whole. So I do, while all of these concerns are absolutely 100% valid, um, I just want to make sure that we're not discounting these, these religious folks in the party, which it does sound like we're talking about do feel discounted in the first place. Um, the Democratic Party is also uh, becoming somewhat less white, and so a lot of the, the religion problem that we have seen is among the white part of the Democratic Party, whereas a lot of the black Protestants, Latino Catholics, um, they are still highly religious and they are still very much involved in the Democratic Party. Um, well, let me follow up with that and pretty soon we'll be coming to your questions. I'm sure there are a bunch of them. Um, each of you in different ways, in the labor movement is a Obama delegate and organizer and campaign consultant. Michael is a White House staffer and campaign guy. Uh, Elizabeth's point is most of the Democratic voters are religious and their faith is a big part of who they are. Is that true of the Democratic consultants, the Democratic donors, mm -hmm. uh, the elites within the party? How do we end up with and that NARAL and Planned Parenthood have a bigger voice in the priorities of a Democratic White House than the labor movement? Uh, what is the gap between uh, the people you need to win elections with and the people who run elections and pay for elections? What's your experience? Absolutely, the donor class and sort of the, I guess you could call them the leadership class within the uh, Democratic Party consultant class is very much out of, out of tune with uh, the rest of the party. The, the part of the, the issue is, and the reason why they control things and, the, and kind of the tone and posture of the party is because they control the reward and punishment mechanism. And we've kind of given that to them. So they get to choose who's going to be in office, who's not going to be in office, who's going to get exposure, who's not going to get exposure. And that is very problematic um, because I think there's two different, so some people say, well, the party's gotten more progressive, that's good. But I think there's two different kinds of progressive, right? If I were to call myself a progressive, I would be talking more so the progressive era where we're talking about social programs for the poor, uh, we're talking about government reform, uh, workers' rights, you can even throw criminal justice in there. That's what I would be referring to. I wouldn't be referring to what a lot of people are now referring to is secular progressivism, where you're talking more about the kind of Western European um, expressive individualism, the affirmation of a very permissive society. There's really a split there. I believe the donor class is on that secular progressive side. And unfortunately, if you look at the policy and what we've been able to get through and prioritize, it seems like that secular progressive side is really taking over that definition and kind of moving along with it. But I think you're right in your assessment. What, what's the labor movement's voice in the party? What, uh, how do you see this? Well, you, you know, I think for many, many years, the labor movement has played a huge, huge role in the Democratic Party. But part of the problem here is the Democratic Party considers us part of the Democratic Party. And they take us, I quite frankly believe, for granted. And I've even had people say to me, well, where else are you going to go? Uh, so that's it. how much enthusiasm are you going to garner from any group, anywhere, anytime, or any place when the people are asking for your help says, where else are you going to go? You've got to come to us because you can't go over to the Republicans and are not going to stand up for organized labor, which is true uh, and for the most part. But understand something here. There's a lot of reasons that Donald Trump is president, right? Most of those reasons are because people have added up to about right here with politics that have been coming our way day in and day out for 50 years, right? So people said, what, what are we going to do here, uh, elect another Democrat or another uh, Republican, and they're going to do the exact same thing over and over again? And if there's nothing else that's happened, uh, Donald Trump <laughs> has changed things, but unfortunately it's been a change that is really really difficult in many, many, many ways, obviously. I'll try to be kind here. Uh, so uh, workers voted for him. Working class folks help elect Donald Trump. We can try to hide from that. We can try to say it didn't happen. We can try to sugarcoat it. But people who work for a living felt more comfortable with him uh, than a Democratic candidate. That's a fact. Now, you, you, can, you can do a lot of things in your life, but don't ignore reality 
and don't ignore the truth because you're doing the exact same thing that we're criticizing the other side for. The truth is that workers voted for Donald Trump in many, many areas of this country. Michael, where you and I first got to know each other, we were working together around the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. And that act passed because 64 Democrats voted to keep the status quo, that abortion would be legal, available, yeah. but you didn't have to pay for someone else's abortion. There was no funding for abortion. Of those 64 Democrats, three of them are left That's right. in the House of Representatives. Some of that was the work of Susan B. Anthony Fund, of the Republican Party. Yeah. Some of that was the work of Democrats who think we're better off with a pure party, that this is a matter of fundamental principle. Some of them think we'd be better off without Joe Manchin. That's right. In oh, West Virginia right. or yeah. Donnelly. And you, you've lived in that reality. What are the attitudes? Part of it's true. I mean, we're, these are fundamental principles. We shouldn't compromise on our principles. We're in charge, you're not. How do you deal with those realities? How can you break through that kind of polarization that allows more respect, frankly, for alternative views, but also might allow Democrats to actually win. Right, yeah, so a few things. So you're right, President Obama repeatedly affirmed Hyde over the course of his presidency, but in 2016. Speak up a little bit. Uh, uh, President Obama reaffirmed Hyde a number of and times Hyde over the course of the audience is? Yeah, Hyde Amendment is the provision that prevents federal funding for abortion. Uh, the 2016 Democratic platform for the first time, the first time in the Democratic Party's history, uh, uh, proactively called for repeal of the Hyde Amendment. For, first time ever. Now, y you would think that, um, well, th there are a lot of ways to cr uh, criticize that. One would be, you would think when the other party is running a uh, uh, person with a questionable sexual history himself, someone who isn't, uh, hasn't expressed a commitment to the pro-life cause in his life, that, that maybe we wouldn't want to, and when Republicans control Congress, that maybe uh, uh, frontlining a repeal of the Hyde Amendment just isn't the smart political thing to do. And then you remember that uh, people like Bob Casey, people like Heidi Heitkamp, asked the party not to do this, but they went over their own members' heads in some cases to do this. Um, part of what happened was, the pro-life sort of activist side has really conspired with pro-choice activists to create this bitter polarization that we see. When President Obama took office, five months into his time as president, he went to Notre Dame. Uh, and usually when Democrats go to uh, religious venues, they'll get, especially Catholic venues, they'll give a message on poverty, they'll give a message on the environment, like something like we, we all generally agree on. Instead, President Obama went to Notre Dame and gave a speech on abortion. In the midst of protests, he actually said, let's find some common ground on abortion. And that launched a two, two and a half year policy process that I was part of the small team. Uh, well, it was a big team, but the small core team that was working on it, uh, where we met with pro-life and pro-choice groups across the spectrum, Concerned Women for America and NARAL had to see at the table. It was really an amazing thing. And I think at the, the outcome of that was uh, supposed to be a a broad policy agenda. Imagine a press conference that had Cecile Richards and Cardinal Dolan at it at the same, I mean, it, it would have been a, a, a critical moment. What happened was uh, politics, midterm elections, uh, actually made it so that, uh, it, uh, Hillary Clinton was asked in the third debate about late-term abortion. The, the traditional Democratic response for the last 30 years to that question, well, A, would have been the Supreme Court's already ruled on that, but B, it would have been uh, we want to make abortions, as John said, safe, legal, and rare. And what was great about the moment that she missed was, uh, by the time of, uh, by the end of President Obama's term, the abortion rate was the lowest it's been since Roe v. Wade. The, how, how, as a Democrat, do you get a question that's pandering, especially after Donald Trump talks about his pro-life values? How do you get that question and not say, well, well, do you know what? If you want to talk about pro-life values. As of today, we have the lowest abortion rate in this country since Roe v. Wade. Instead, she actually made a defense of late-term abortion, which, which is insane. It's already, the Supreme Court already ruled on it. And so we have this situation where pro-choice activists decided uh, during Obama's time in office that they thought his rhetoric 
treating abortion as a moral issue. Uh, uh, he said on numerous oca occasions, no matter what you think about the legality of it, abortion is a tragic moral issue. They said that that was too big of a concession. That actually, if you concede anything, even on the rhetorical front, which safe, legal, rare is a concession for them on the rhetorical front, then you're actually giving something to the pro-life side. And then, of course, on the pro-life side, they, they said, we don't want to give any bona fides to people like Joe Donnelly, who uh, may not vote to overturn Roe v. Wade, but will vote for a 20-week ban. We don't want to give any bona fides to uh, members that would vote uh, to uh, keep the Hyde Amendment, even if they may not vote for a 20-week ban. And so you have this really, uh, you, you have both parties representing views that leave out a majority of the country. A majority of the country uh, thinks that there should be more restrictions on abortion while well, you should keep it legal, and neither of our parties support that view. Yeah. If uh, you think we're just trashing the Democratic Party and that's unfair, <laughs> Uh, how many of you were here for the Republican discussion a month ago? Uh, President Trump did not do very well in that discussion, <laughs> it would be fair to say. Uh, we're going to ask people to invite, uh, ask questions, and I'm going to ask one while we're setting up the mics. And uh, A lot of this is focused on cultural values and respect and how people talk. One of my concerns is that Democrats seem to have lost their voice. When you think about environmental justice or racial justice or economic justice or immigrant justice or global justice, ultimately this may require some sacrifice. It certainly calls people to compassion. That's right. And that used to be sort of the go-to place for the Democratic Party. And the party seems to have lost its voice. When you talk about climate change, coal miners are gonna be affected. So where is the compassion? You don't say everybody's gonna make wind turbines. You say there's gotta be a way to take care of the people who've been providing energy here. If you're gonna talk about racial justice, for most of us, the way we overcome our prejudice and our, and our racism, in part is because of our faith, which calls us to something better. And Democrats, I'm afraid, I'm gonna throw this to Justin, have, have lost their voice in appealing to people's faith and their morality. It's always their self-interest. It's mm -hmm. always about increasing the middle class. You have a different message for the party. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll start off by saying something positive just so we can get that in there. I, I, still, do, <laughs> I still do believe that the Democratic Party uh, better serves those in need and is more compassionate than the Republican Party. And that's why I remain to be in the party. I think that does need to be said. But to your point about the tone and what we're asking people to do and how we're going about it, I think the civil rights movement has something to say about this. Because the civil rights movement, as we know, was about changing policy. Uh, it was about changing systems. Uh -huh. But they knew something else that I think we've lost today in all of our enlightenment. It was that there was something bigger than that. And that the worst thing that could happen to you wasn't that you lose the policy or that you fail to change the system. The worst thing that could happen to you would be for you to allow your opposition or the situation to have a negative impact on your spirit. Because you could win everything else, and if, you, and if, the, way you, if the way that you interacted with people, treated your neighbor, or the way you went about things was wrong, then you lost. And I think the Democratic Party really needs to understand that we can, if Trump gets out, it's kicked out in 2020. And at the end of the day, we talk to Republicans differently, we look at our neighbor differently, then we haven't won anything. Um, and unless, until we understand that there is a spiritual component to all this, and as mm. Christians, we should certainly understand that, mm. there is a spiritual component, and that was the reason that the civil rights movement could have people spitting on them, dogs, fire hoses, and all those things, but what you don't do is let them kill your spirit. You may lose on that day, but you don't let them kill your spirit, and until we get that back, I think we're going to be in trouble. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, come to the microphone, identify yourself. I'll repeat the line I always use. Please put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> Most appeal here. That's Who's right. got something to say? Or I'll, I'll keep asking. What, uh, if nobody's running for the mic, doesn't Trump give the Democrats a huge opportunity here? This oh, yeah. is the least religious, <laughs> most religiously illiterate, most libertarian in terms of his personal life. Isn't there a moment here? 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Democrats, I think that there are some sort of defensive things that they, they need to take care of, but this should be a, a offensive moment where they are embracing and inviting religious communities to the table. Uh, Senator Bennett and Senator uh, Brown from Ohio have a bill that UNC Wilmington professors say would cut child poverty in half. Uh, I've been looking, waiting for the time when they're gonna invite faith leaders to take ownership over a proposal like that. And, 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 and it hasn't come. I've been waiting for the moment. Uh, Speaker Pelosi actually held an amazing press conference with uh, uh, religious leaders around DACA, but that was, uh, that was back in March when it was crunch time. Why aren't those meetings being held today? Why weren't they being held nine months ago? To actually just, again, like we would with any other community, invite them to take ownership over the aspects of the democratic agenda that they embrace, and there are many. And I just, the electoral benefits are clear, especially on labor issues and issues of the working poor. It's not just the policy, but when you invite people to come as they are, as religious people to these issues, uh, Faith and Public Life did work around the Ohio labor uh, uh, referendum, I think in 2010, and showed a significant double digit jumps among white evangelicals and white Catholics when you reference things like uh, uh, the golden rule, when you reference Matthew 25, when you said that this was a, 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 about Christian compassion. And so I think this is a major opportunity for Democrats. I think people like Senator Chris Coons in Delaware, even uh, Senator Kamala Harris, I, I, it did not miss me, uh, miss my attention that uh, where she decided to go to deliver, I think, her first national message appeal was to a church. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren have both appeared at, uh, and Joe Kennedy have both appeared at religious gatherings in the last uh, few weeks. And so we're seeing some members step out. The problem is, as you mentioned, John, um, we need a, uh, uh, at the staff level, um, we need uh, uh, a resurgence of, of just basic religious literacy so that staffers don't feel like they're swimming in the deep end, so that communication staffers don't feel like uh, they have some certainty about, about how stories are gonna play out. They have a great sense of how if, the, if their member introduces a policy around uh, women's rights or introduces a policy around uh, 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 criminal justice reform, they know what the trajectory of that story is gonna be. They don't have such a great sense when it comes to religion stories and so they just kind of back off and it's a, it's a structural pro problem. In the and I would, I would say, Michael, if I may, that there's two ways of seizing that opportunity. There's the positive way that you're talking about where you can actually build the party and, and actually be looking for disciples to bring people in. Then there's a negative way to uh, seize that opportunity because we know that extremes feed off other extremes. <laughs> so if I see Donald Trump and I'm a, you know, a far left group or a group who is outside of the mainstream, I can use what he's doing to pull the party further to the, to the, uh, to the extreme, right? And that would be a negative way of kind of seizing that opportunity. And I think that's so unfortunately it's happening more than the positive way of actually building a better party and so hopefully that changes but that's problematic. Yeah. Elizabeth, uh, you have been studying Trump and its impact on all this stuff. You've also been studying Pope Francis and his impact on that. These are two very different figures. What? Uh, <laughs> no. Oh, wow. <laughs> what an observation. Both outsiders, <laughs> but both sure. big surprises. Uh, what, what opportunities would uh, President Trump and Pope Francis create for progressive Democrats to rally people of faith? I think, so some of what we've been struck by in both President Trump's election and in Pope Francis's um, election as well is almost the, the lack of change, if I may, in, in how the parties and how people have responded to these. So with President Trump, for example, and it's less so in the Democratic Party, we know that he still got the vast majority of the white evangelical vote, even though, as we've talked about, you might have expected really religious voters to not embrace a man who said and did the things that he said and did. And so you you didn't see the change that you expected to see there. Um, you did see that slight dip in support uh, for the Democratic nominee, but that we also learned a lot about people's votes for Trump versus against Clinton. There were a lot more votes 
against a nominee here or against a candidate in this particular election. Um, so that's one thing to kind of keep in mind here. As far as Pope Francis, he had all of this, all of these speeches, all of these talks, the encyclicals, everything on the environment and on being compassionate and all of these, you know, be better and promoting these values. Um, and we still saw white Catholics vote for Trump by about 23 point margin. So it didn't really resonate in the way that people expected it to. So while we weren't completely surprised to see white Catholics vote Republican, they have been shifting that way for past decade or so. Um, these public figures, what they've said on the public stage that didn't really have the impact that we might have, we might have expected at the same time to kind of contradict myself, even though I, you know, I study religion, I, I love this, I think this is really important. Um, <laughs> we also know that religion is not necessarily the primary motivator in a lot right. of this, that partisanship is very strong, getting stronger, and that a lot of time partisanship will trump religion, religious affiliation specifically, in the vote choices that people make. Okay, Susan? Uh, hi, I, I was fascinated by the conversation about self-identity that growing up we all saw ourselves as Catholic, Democrat, and our ethnic groups. Um, and that certainly seems to have changed in America. Mm -hmm. But when you re referenced 81% of the evangelicals, <clears throat> pardon me, voting for Trump, are they people who self-identify as evangelicals or is that one of many things that they self-identify. And in other words, do they see themselves as teachers first or a woman ah. first or what is their self-identity? And my other question would be, would that have happened had the evangelical leaders not come out and supported Trump? Yeah, well, I, I, I'd, I'd defer to our friend from Pew on, uh, my, my, my sense is uh, we don't have a great sense of where uh, their faith sort of fits in their sort of uh, spectrum of identi identities. There's, it, uh, there's some interesting polling them and, and sort of uh, speculation that I'm not quite convinced of that those who were more religious who attended church weekly, for instance, uh, uh, voted uh, voted for Trump less than those who were only monthly or sporadic attenders. I've seen mixed, uh, though. Again, I defer. Um, uh, what I what I will say is, um, oh, and I'm, I'm miss what was the second part of your question? Uh, the role of leaders. Ah, yes. So you know. <laughs> 2016, and I'm seeing my friend from the National Association of Evangelicals here, uh, 2016 really exposed the crisis of authority in evangelicalism. Evangelicals have always prided themselves on not having a hierarchical structure, on not really have, having a burdensome institutions, uh, but what we saw was actually evangelical leadership quite split. Um, we saw, of course, Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. sort of put their thumb on the scale heavily, but we also saw people like Beth Moore, who's uh, the leading female evangelist for the Southern Baptist Convention, and Russell Moore, and uh, Ann Voskamp. These names might not mean it. They're huge figures in evangelicalism. Uh, if not endorse Clinton or say that they outright oppose Trump, definitely <laughs> send some pretty clear signals. What we saw is it just didn't matter much, that uh, evangelicals aren't used to taking direct, especially political cues from their uh, religious leaders unless they, unless they associate with someone like Tony Perkins or unless they associate in a sort of religious political camp. And so it just didn't translate. As I talk with evangelical leaders, that's one of the major points of concern, not so much the political outcome, but what does it mean when people are so segmenting off politics from the influence of their faith? And it's a, we have a major crisis of authority and public theology and evangelicalism that's going to continue to play out uh, ecclesially within the church and obviously in, in society and politics. Okay. Over here. Yes. Uh, my name is Francis Harden. I have a question for Cecil Roberts um, about what I think is voting against their interests, your members. I come out of a union background. My father was Carpenters and Joiners, my mother ILGW, and I'm a member of SAG-AFTRA. Um, and I just wonder if you could explain why you think your members voted against their interest and have fallen for what I think is a canard that coal is coming back when it's been displaced by natural gas. 
But I think that uh, the point you make is a good one, but uh, as most people who look at this issue look at, a ver at it very narrowly, it's bro much broader than that. If I told you that in the year 2000, that was the first time since 1928 that West Virginia voted for a Republican that was a non-incumbent. So from 1928 to 2000, and we're not talking about President Trump here, they voted against Al Gore. And the reason they voted against Al Gore, uh, and by the way, we supported uh, the Vice President, okay? Uh, the, the reason they voted against uh, the, uh, Vice President Gore is that they felt that he was gonna do away with their jobs, mm -hmm. and if you read what he was talking about, that was true. Uh, what needs to happen here is, if you listen to some of my remarks when I was on my high horse here at the beginning. <laughs> uh, I apologize for that slightly. By the way, I think now's the time to be highly critical of the Democratic Party. That's where I'm <laughs> extremely, uh, 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 I, I believe that, because this is not the elite's party, this is our party. And we have a voice in this party. If we don't exercise that voice, we're not going to have a voice. So if we can't have a voice in the Democratic Party, I don't know where we can, but uh, they, I think the people in Appalachia uh, have gone from being firm believers in the Democratic Party to believing that uh, what has been decided here, and I want you to think about this as we leave here today, that climate change uh, cannot be corrected by America alone. We all know that. that we hear every scientist say that, and that's true. What people in Appalachia believe is that our people in leadership have decided, let's let it be cured on the backs of the people who live in Appalachia because we have no voice. We don't have enough votes. We don't have enough power. So there has not been a position, in my opinion, articulated by those in power on the Democratic Party that says, look, this is a problem, and America's gonna deal, deal with this problem, and this is the way we're gonna do, do this. Uh, I was with uh, uh, then candidate Obama in in Lebanon, Virginia, as far down in the coal fields as you can get, okay? <laughs> Lebanon High School. And he repeatedly said, if we can put a man on the moon, we can figure out how to burn coal cleanly. And if you let me, President, I will invest in technology to see that that happens over and over again. And if you look at the first two years that he was in office, when he gave the State of the Union address, he talked about technology being used to save coal jobs, but that somewhere evaporated, okay? Mm -hmm. So people in, in Appalachia, and people are always looking, by the way, of well, how many coal miners are there? Well, it's not coal miners. There's about a four to six to eight ratio of jobs created by every coal miner who's got a job. So anybody living in Appalachia is being supported by those jobs in the coal industry. And they're going away, there's no question. Natural gas is taking their jobs. But where's the plan? Where is the plan? I'm, I have been uh, fighting for the last 10 years to save retirees' health care. Uh, every day of my life is dedicated. Now, I'm fighting to save the pension plan of 100,000 retired coal miners. Where's the plan? Who's talking about that? That's what I but want to hear. Where's That's what plan? I want. Where's the plan from this administration to save retirees? I never said there was a plan from this okay. administration, <laughs> ever. And by the way, I am a, a, I am a Democrat but I am not a Democrat that's gonna fall in line with anything and everything somebody says. I think if this party also is my party and I've got a right to have a voice in it. And one of the things I would say to you, there's an old labor song that came from the 30s. It says, we have been quiet for too long now. <laughs> Thank you for that. I would have thought it was which side are you on, boys. That was, that, well, which side are you on? That came out of a UMWA yeah household, too, by the way. <laughs> One of the great things about Pope Francis' encyclical, he talks about care for creation, care for the poor. He lifts up workers as a central True. question. Absolutely. And talks about how uh, we care for creation and for uh, the least of these. Galen. Uh, Galen Carey with the National Association of Evangelicals. Um, to what extent do Democratic leaders understand that uh, a number of their policies, particularly in the areas of non-discrimination, um, threaten the very existence of religious organizations like schools and charities and, and so forth? Uh, a lot of peop people that I know who are evangelical Christians uh, appreciate a lot of things that Democratic politicians support, immigration, criminal justice, um, environmental protection and so forth, 
Uh, but they're hard pressed to, to come to vote for some, someone who's going to put into place policies that might threaten the very existence of the college that they attended. And in fact, in places where uh, Democrats are in power in state and local levels, uh, though we see those kind of things happening. So that's, I wonder, do Democratic leaders understand that and they don't really care? Or is it an area of maybe a blind spot for some of them? Yeah, I would say to the, to the extent that they do understand it, they don't care as much because, again, you have this donor class who may understand it very well but doesn't have a problem with eliminating kind of those views. And there's very much this strong feeling within the party, as I get it, and I explained my story earlier, that they're trying to eliminate certain views. And so there's also a mis... And so the, the other side of it, there is somewhat of a misunderstanding of the free exercise clause. Uh, it's this idea that that's, you know, religious liberty is good as long as it's the stuff that we can kind of say, ah, let's agree to disagree. But that's not what it's there for. The, the free exercise clause is for the stuff that we can't just necessarily get over, that we really disagree with, that you may find offensive, that you think someone else shouldn't believe, but that's what it's there for to protect. And I think there is, on the Democratic side, somewhat of a misunderstanding about that because of this expressive individualism and the affirmation of, of that, uh, of that uh, ideology. And so those are some of the things that we're going to have to that we're going to have to work on. But at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter because as long as the donor and the political class are in control of that and they're they're fine with eliminating it, then you're not going to see ex expressed in it, uh, much of our policy. Uh, uh, because uh, Maria Teresa is not here and she might have a different view, let me try and articulate. I happen to share the concern here. Two things strike me. One. Who was the genius that thought picking a fight with the Little Sisters of the Poor was a winner? I mean, was, absolutely. Uh, secondly, uh, who was the person on the other side who said Taco Bell That's defending right. them was a winner? Exactly. I mean, it seems to me both sides have overreached here, mm -hmm. and we ought to decide that abortion is different than other issues, and that uh, in order to uh, ensure that poor people uh, get some attention that religious groups motivated by faith who provide shelter, who provide food, can do so consistent with their values. I, there's a lot of good things the ACLU does. There's not a lot of them providing shelter in Anacostia <laughs> or health care in Africa. So one of the, I think the best argument on religious liberty is everybody ought to retreat from the extremes and we ought to focus on the common good. And frankly, without religious groups motivated by faith to provide essential services for the poor, the poor are going to be worse off and our nation True. is going to be diminished. That's, yeah. that's uh, exactly I, right. Oh. Oh. So I'm, let's I'm sorry, I just want to quickly add, if, if, you, if you asked uh, the average person on the right and the average person on the left, they would both say the principal religious freedom challenge right now is the cake baker. And Galen's question just indicated, like, that, that, that is not both in, in scale and in the minds of actual religious people. We're talking about colleges, we're talking about hospitals, we're talking about churches and parachurch ministries, and yet this is another issue where uh, our, our polarized extreme parties are, and activists are happy to focus on these very sort of divisive sort of uh, uh, catchy issues that really are, are, they're important, but they're on the periphery of the religious freedom debate. Ca uh, Democratic leaders in California are saying that Catholic hospitals that yeah. don't do abortions ought to be denied federal yeah, funds. Extreme. That's where we are. Yeah. Justin, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about, I've heard some of the folks from the Ann campaign talking about black voters feeling very taken for granted, right. especially so urban communities. If you could speak to that. And then, John, I just wondered on the Catholic level, like in terms of challenging Catholic white voters, if you think there will be mm -hmm. something like we had the, you know, we have this Fortnite for Freedom thing that's been very institutionalized and, yeah. and driven. Will there be something like that on the immigration issue that will put that in front of the parishes as kind of a white parish, Hispanic yeah. parish? Just like the Fortnite was, will there be something like that for this tragedy? Do you think it'll happen? But thank you. Yeah, first I would have to say that obviously black Christians aren't a monolith, but, but I can speak to the people from my tradition and 
I really come from a constituency of Democrats uh, that is very much in the mold of uh, civil rights legend Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, meaning that our political perspective is informed and very much bound to the black Protestant biblical uh, tradition. Um, and so for us, while you know, social justice has great importance, it's also coupled with an understanding and an appreciation of classic values, of a sense of morality that is set and doesn't, and doesn't change with the times. And that's, I think, very different than where the party is going. The message that I get now, and there's, there, are two, um, pe there are two guys who ran for office, two black Christians who are in the same tradition as I, I am in Georgia, who ran for office in the Atlanta metro area, uh, one for state senate, one for mayor. And when they ran, because they were Christians and had made statements, they were completely, I mean, demolished by the liberal establishment. And when I say that, I mean going to forums and being shouted down. Um, and if you look up their names on the internet, they were uh, just uh, smeared all over the place, uh, ads and mailers that went out. And so what the message was to, to the black community who was paying attention, because they were smart enough to kind of isolate these guys. They didn't make it a huge deal. But the message that I received was, know your place. We want your votes, but we don't want you in office if you hold certain, certain types of beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the Democratic Party that we're going to have, they're going to run into trouble. Because the <laughs> only thing that is keeping a party that does that to its base alive is the fact that there's Trump in office and there's that's some right. other terrible things happening. That's but exactly. That's not going to last forever. And it doesn't necessarily bring the lowest vote. Yeah. Well, a couple, uh, you asked about the Catholic community. Uh, one, we ought to be clear that the right demonizes, diminishes, attacks. I mean, the the level of polarization. If you're you're a Catholic that doesn't toe the line perfectly, you get undermined really fast and called a lot of names. So this is this is a problem. We just had three days on polarization, and we'll be sharing some of that. Uh, in terms of the Catholic community, my experience is that the current crisis has mobilized the Catholic community. I'm in a little parish in Prince George's County. Uh, my pastor talked about the border. He's a lovely guy. He doesn't always talk about the border, believe me. Uh, <laughs> my sense is that the bishops are talking about doing a pilgrimage to the border. I think, frankly, the Catholic bishops have been the leaders on immigration, on DACA and beyond. And we got to remind people not everybody's a college valedictorian. <laughs> We're for immigrants who come because they're escaping violence and want a better life for their society. I never thought the fortnight, first of all, I think it was the people that advised us to name this, pick the name. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think we need a fortnight. I think we need to be the church. Hmm. And I'll be blunt. Uh, could a pro France, could a Pope Francis Catholic, run for office in the Democratic Party and be supported? Could a Pope Francis Catholic be nominated for a judicial position? Absolutely not. Never. Could a Pope Francis Catholic have Steve Jobs, have uh, Michael's job in a future Democratic White House? I doubt it. Uh, one of the things, I looked up the Democratic platform on uh, website on the web, and it said, we support religious participation because we support tolerance. Yeah. First of all, I don't recall that being the first value in the Bible. <laughs> but I frankly don't experience a lot of tolerance. The things that I care most about that the Democratic Party stands for, they don't talk about much. The things that I'm uncomfortable with, those seem to be the litmus tests. And so my hope is a new generation of leaders that aren't as stuck uh, with what we've had will come forward and transform politics. I hope Trump does that. I hope Pope Francis does that. Enough for me. Excellent. Hello. Um, I'm Michael. I'm a junior in the college. I just remember vividly around the time of the Heath Mellow uh, campaign mm -hmm. that uh, the chairman, uh, Tom Perez, said specifically, almost using the language of a bishop, that being, if you're a Democrat, it's unnegotiable. It's a un non-negotiable issue to be uh, in favor of abortion. So uh, what, what specifically are the dynamics surrounding that? And um, hmm. what um, do you think, ch what changes uh, could move those dynamics in a more favor uh, 
in a direction more favorable to people of faith. Hey, Michael. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a, you know, so many mixed messages are being sent, and that's kind of the point. Like, like the kind of the point is they have, they know that uh, we have Donnelly, Heitkamp, Mansion up, and so they can't be completely inhospitable, but they want to put out a climate that's, <laughs> that tries to make folks at least un uncomfortable and, and, and send the message to, um, to activists that they're, they're putting their foot down and therefore you should give money. Um, you know, I was uh, at, a, at another forum, I heard Perez make the, make the case to um, uh, Democrats, both pro-choice and pro-life Democrats, but Democrats <clears throat> who, sorry, uh, who believe in a big tent party, he said, oh, you know, he said, I, I was in the party in the 90s when we went through all these fights, and Democrats have always disagreed on stuff, um, but, but we believe in having a big tent party, and so what that means is, and I'm obviously paraphrasing a little bit here, but he said, but basically what that means is you could believe whatever you want on this issue as long as, as, long as you don't vote like it. And, and I, I, I said, I said uh, Chairman Perez, uh, we, we both served with a vice president who said that the budget is a moral document, which it is. Every, every vote you take is voting your values. Uh, and so it doesn't make sense, even in our schematic, to think that, that you're truly being welcoming of people uh, as long as they can't vote a certain way. I, I will say political, okay, leadership, political leadership will make a big difference here. But it made a difference when Barack Obama took... Uh, we no started take. late, no. but we're going late, so what I'm going to suggest is we take these last three questions together and ask the panel to respond, and then we'll wrap it up. Join us. Okay. Identifiers? Yes. Well, just to follow up the last 20 minutes of uh, conversation here, uh, kind of a rhetorical question. Is there anything to uh, lead you to believe that uh, election of a Democrat wouldn't be the death knell for Catholic Social Services in the United States? Oh. Okay, well, that's <laughs> subtle. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's pretty powerful. Uh, my question is this. I assume, I think it's a fair assumption, a reasonable assumption, that uh, the Democratic, let's call them the kingmakers, the party leaders, the donors, and the politicians on balance thinks their strategy is a winning strategy. Mm. And if they think it's a winning strategy, how do you convince them that it's not? Because clearly, they're not getting the message. Okay. Winning strategy or not? Uh, pretty close to what he just said. Uh, <laughs> two points. One, how, do that, how does that 33% of nuns engage with the religious part of the Democratic Party? And two, how can the Democratic Party pivot towards what it should be messaging on, given the climate, given the donors, um, given the general environment? So Thank you. Uh, what do we do <laughs> to change things? And if we don't change things, we'll... Uh, religious-based social services provide, yeah. and whatever else you want to say in conclusion. Yeah. Elizabeth? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> sure. uh, I'll speak to the last question first. Uh, as far as how they engage with religious voters, it's not going to be, or it's not going to be too much different than how unaffiliated engage with religious people by and large in the American public. These are people who are obviously in the Democratic Party because they do have a lot of shared values. There is already this kind of care and compassion that is shared across religious and non-religious folks, um, this care for immigration, this care for, um, you know, for the poor and disenfranchised, and this desire to see a furthering of racial equality that is shared across uh, this party and across a lot of religious groups as well. Um, I, I would also just say that <coughs> Maybe one of the things that we're seeing is that because this party is so comprised of so many different groups, it's hard to get one cohesive message. And so we talk about you know, how to get the Democratic Party to focus on what it should be focusing on. They might have a somewhat harder job in that because there are so many different interested parties. I can't speak to the leadership of the Democratic Party. I can really only speak to how people are responding to these survey questions. And they are responding in similar ways, but they are still very different groups of people. And to have one cohesive message that the party can can implement in this one cohesive strategy to get everybody on the same page, it's difficult. And one more thing that I'll point out is that I would suspect, I don't know as far as strategy goes, but I would suspect that both parties pay attention to how these different issues affect um, voting. And so we know from our surveys that 
when people are talking about what is very important in their vote choice for the next election, whether it be midterms or presidential election, a lot of these issues, these hot button issues that we've been talking about, abortion or uh, same sex marriage or just views towards LGBTQ in general, those are very low on the priority list for many Americans across parties and even across religious groups, even for Catholics, um, abortion does not play a big role in your vote choice in overall, not to people personally, but as far as we've seen in our surveys, it's very low. And the top priorities that people talk about are the economy, foreign policy, terrorism, these things that are across the board. And so I would suspect without trying to speculate that the parties pay attention to these things and they know what people decide to vote on and when that's not religion, it's going to be a harder case to bring religion to the forefront in these parties. Justin? Yeah, in regard to the winning strategy point of view, I think you hit it on the head. All of these are political calculations. I mean, we, let's not make it too uh, complicated. Uh, at the end of the day, the reason that the platform is the way that it is, whether it's religious liberty or it's um, abortion, is because people like ourselves aren't speaking up. And so right. we, you know, let's not put the, all the onus on other people, let's put it on ourselves to say anybody in here who cares about those issues and is a Democrat, the reason the Democrats have gone that way is because we haven't spoken up enough, we haven't been organized enough. One of the things that I say within my community is we have to stop defining ourselves politically by our, by our opposition to conservatives. There may be a lot of things to oppose, but when your opposition becomes the standard, doing what's right becomes secondary. And instead, right. you want to go to the opposite direction. So at the end of the day, instead of saying what I need to say about abortion, saying what I need to say about religious liberty, I don't want to give the Republicans a leg up, and so I'm just going to be quiet. Yeah. That is the wrong way to go about politics, right. but I think it's a very prevalent way um, in today's society because our, uh, our religion, I, I think our partisanship and our ideology have become religious in nature, <laughs> and as we said earlier, it's beginning to trump what our true faith is. Michael? Um, uh, sure. Uh, uh, you know, I, I just say a, a couple things. One, I think uh, uh, that we need to, the National Party has to give, uh, especially in 2018, National Party has to give campaigns the flexibility to run the races they need to Amen. run in, or, in, in order to win. You need to let Joe Donnelly be Joe Donnelly. Exactly. And then, you know, looking forward to 2020, the, the party has the potential to put forward a positive, proactive faith platform on issues that are important to the faith community, both positive and uh, again, they are a bit defensive, and take that out to the country, just like we would, again, with any other community, and that's what I hope the party will do. Well, I, Robert. Yeah, I'd just like to say, we, I think we keep looking at the president's uh, situation, the presidential race, and talking about that, but really, so many things are developed on a local level, whether it's in the state legislature or the city council or in a governor's uh, mansion, but we, and I'm, and I'm talking about Democrats right now, we need to take back the Congress of the United States of America, and we can do that. Now, I played a role in the Connor Lamb uh, election, and I'm proud that I did, mm -hmm. because I think you have to have a candidate that speaks to the wishes of his constituency as opposed to somebody in California, no criticism, or somebody in, in Washington, D.C., or somebody in New York City. Connor Lamb fit the congressional district in for. southwestern Pennsylvania, and they asked me to come down there and speak, and workers got excited about him. There's two things we've given up as Democrats. Patriotism has been taken over by the Republican Party, and God has been taken over <laughs> by the Republican Party. <laughs> and I don't think we ought to give either one of them to them, quite frankly, <laughs> because they haven't earned that. No. Now, let, let, let me tell you this, just so we're clear, if you give somebody God and patriotism, I don't know who's going to win, but I know who's going to lose. <laughs> And it's going to be the person that doesn't have both of those things going for him. Connor Lamb embraced uh, both of those things. But when I went down there in five minutes, I think everybody in that rally said, we're going to support this guy. We're going to work for him because of his service to the United States of America and his religion that he wasn't afraid of, that he That's stood right. up and spoke out that I am a churchgoer, I believe in God, and he wasn't embarrassed uh, by that. I 
the thing I said about he's a God-fearing, patriotic, job-creating, he's gun owner, there's nothing wrong with owning a gun, it's just those automatic weapons we're talking about here, labor supporting, uh, health care defending, social security believing, Pennsylvania Democrat, and he got to be elected, and he was elected, and that's what we need some more of. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I think you forgot is he's a Catholic. That's good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can support a Catholic. Uh, 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 a couple closing thoughts. Uh, one, uh, we focus a lot on cultural issues. The Democratic Party needs to reach out to religious voters, not to convince people on cultural issues. It's because so much else yeah. is at stake. There are minimal requirements of respect and openness, tolerance, to use the word. Abortion is not going to be outlawed. Gay marriage, the country's decided. Now the question is, with those things in place, how are we going to deal with religious institutions and religious people? One of the questions for cultural elites is, can you accept yes for an answer? <laughs> uh, and will there be some uh, openness to the work of religious institutions and to the reservations of other people? It seems to me the Democratic Party has adopted a strategy of mobilization. And it turns out there's not enough people to mobilize. That's right. Then now they're going to try organization and mobilization. And it's hard to figure out how you end Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Michigan <coughs> under the current circumstances, at least with these kind of candidates. Uh, Sean began with listening and learning. That would be good. <laughs> how about engaging and persuading? Yes. And showing some respect and not uh, being condescending. Mm. Uh, I think a party that listens and learns, that engages and persuades, and then that organizes and mobilizes for an agenda that invites people in instead of pushing people away can probably prevail. And given what's happened in our country, that's really important. So the, a couple things I want to say. One is I apologize that we've had mostly guys up here and no Latinos. That was not the plan. Maria uh, Teresa was supposed to be here, and she regrets that she couldn't. Secondly, I am really grateful to the people that have been here and the wisdom and the passion they brought to this. And join me in thanking them.